Good afternoon, this is Julia Whitup with Talk Story TV, and I have with me today Trey Carland, who is the author of a book called The Seeker's Guide to Inner Peace. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and he's going to tell us more about his book. Um, I guess it started back in... 2004, and I started having these little, what I was calling at the time, revelation spells. And at the time, I wasn't sure exactly what was going on, but my, I would get this sudden surge of energy and felt like I was having a divine revelation of sorts. And everything made perfect sense. And during these brief episodes, which only lasted a couple of minutes at most, my, uh, my thoughts would kind of just drift away, and I could observe my thoughts, but I didn't have any control over them. And I could never remember what I thought after the spell had passed. And I felt like the, whatever I thought was the key. Whatever, I, whatever thoughts that occurred to me were what made the universe make perfect sense all of a sudden. Um, but after they passed, I couldn't remember what I had thought. Um, but so I had this sense of I just lost it. I had the answer to the, the universe, and now it's gone. Um, but it was it was really uh, exhilarating while it lasted. And I had several of these over the course of um, about a year, I guess. And then on November seventh of 2004, I had a grand mal seizure, and when that happened, I ended up in the emergency room, um, woke up, and, and the doctor told me I'd had a seizure, and when he said that, I realized, oh, I, I was feeling that, that strange feeling right before I blacked out, so that led to seeing some neurologists and um, doing some research, and the neurologist basically told me these little revelation spells, as I was calling them, were actually um, partial complex seizures. Mm -hmm. And so we went with that, you know, started looking for medicine that might control the grand mal seizures, which were happening in the beginning. They started happening a little bit more often. Um, and we finally found a combination of medicines that kept the grand malls under control, but I was still having the occasional um, partial seizures, which were no longer pleasant little revelation spells. They were more like a sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and during that, that early, I guess it was early 2005, um, my wife and I were both doing a lot of research on a lot of different subjects, and, and I felt this drive to, to learn basically the meaning of life. So I was reading books on um, religion and science and um, pretty much everything I'd get my hands on, and I'd never been a big reader prior to this and had no interest in any of this stuff. But once this all happened, there was just this, this drive to find out. And it, I guess it was 2006 by the time I was turned on to this idea of enlightenment. And when that, when I ran across that, then I realized basically that's what I've been looking for. This, this whole time I've been looking for answers, and now I know what the answer is I'm looking for. Um, so I focused my search on the idea of enlightenment, studied all these different teachers, um, some of the most influential teachers were Eckhart Tolle mm -hmm. and Byron Katie, both probably my two favorite, um, but I read lots more. And the book kind of runs the gamut from about the time I started the search till about a year ago when I finally decided I've got, I've got this journal, all these different blog posts. I kept a blog during this period of time. I was sharing 
all my experiences with everybody and anybody who would listen, basically. So I started blogging, sending out emails each time I'd, I'd blog and say, you know, here's my latest discovery or revelation or whatever. And so I took all these blog posts and I put them together in a book and finally got it out, I guess, a little over a year ago. Um, and it's been quite a journey, uh, to say the least. But mm-hmm. I, I felt like all this needed to be out. It was like, this needs to be shared. I, once I discovered this idea of enlightenment, I, I was driven to share. I couldn't keep it to myself, you know. So that that's was a book in a nutshell. <laughs> that's okay. That's interesting. And so what have you been doing to uh, market the book? Um, I've been doing some local book readings, book signings. Um, there's been I've done two so far, and they've been pretty successful. A surprising number of people showed up for each one, and I thought like it was a good opportunity to um, share to a broader audience these things that I I feel like everybody should know. Um, so I'm trying to plant these little seeds of interest. <laughs> See what grows. And uh, what what uh, formats is your book available in? Um, I've got it in um, softback, available through Amazon.com, as well as various and sundry other outlets, and on Kindle and um, other ebook formats too. The Nook, I guess it's called. Uh huh. So pretty much anything you can you can get your hands on, you can find the book in. And do you have it out in audio? You know, I don't yet, but I've been thinking of doing that. Yeah, I think that's a... I think... I love audio books. Yeah. I've been thinking of doing that, and maybe there's several little recommended meditation techniques in the book, too, and I thought about maybe creating a CD of guided meditations to go along with it, because I think mm-hmm. that's an important part of what the book covers, is meditations that... I've come up with sort of as a result of um, an experience I've had, pointers, um, pointers to the present moment, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, have you, what about a book trailer? Do you have a book trailer? No, I don't. No, I'm not real familiar with what a book trailer is like. It's just a, like a little video that gets people interested in your book, but like a movie trailer, but it's a book trailer. <laughs> okay, I'll probably do one then. I I did videotape one of the book readings and have that up on YouTube on my website. So um, I thought that was a nice uh, a nice way to put it out there for people who couldn't attend. Uh, yeah, and. Come, but did you happen? Did you write a guest blog for us? We we have a blog, and we'd love to have a guest blog from you. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, because that I put that up with your show on uh, TVBackstory.com, and so if you and you can put links in it, photos, whatever you want. Okay. Sounds great. I'll do that. Okay. Let's see. What else did I want to ask you? Um, did you design your own cover of the book? I did. The um, I had some. My brother-in-law, who's a graphic uh, designer, he had the software that was needed to put it together. But I showed him the different components that I wanted um, and told him how I wanted it to look, and he put it together so but. all right great do you happen to have it with you can you hold it up okay okay secret's guide to inner peace okay how about reading us something out of it looks like you got a bunch of things marked I know I do it's like I've read it several times and it's almost like reading somebody else's book <laughs> out of it the second time, but it's 
So I flagged all these pages with nice quotes and whatnot and stories, and, um, you know, there's too many to, to go into, but there are a few interesting little pivotal, pivotal moments, I guess, in my life um, that might be worth noting. Um, this experience happened to me in October of 2007. I'd already been an active seeker, I guess you'd say, for a few years. Um, and But this was the first time I'd actually had a, uh, what shall I say, a significant awakening experience. Okay. So, um, let's see. Um, this day we were in a car on a beautiful day. My wife was driving, and I was just taking in the scenery on a stretch of road that I'd seen hundreds of times before. I started to do an eyes open meditation technique I'd read about the day before, which included the typical suggestions of relaxing tense muscles, letting go of thoughts as they arise, etc. A few moments after this, a strange sensation began to occur. It was a sense of fear, almost like the stage fright you might encounter before making a speech. As it intensified, I felt some tension in my body. The sensation was almost like an aura that I might encounter prior to a seizure, which added to the fear of what was getting ready to happen. Instead of trying to change the mental subject, as I've done before when encountering this type of fear, I relaxed and surrendered into it. The message I received while I was on the tipping point was, you're doing it for humanity. You're doing what? You're doing it for humanity. Oh, okay. That gave me the final push I needed to surrender. At that point, a warm, tingly sensation began to occur in my body, and it grew more intense and felt almost orgasmic in nature. I was overcome with a feeling of joy, exhilaration, and it seemed to escalate to a point and then evened out as I took in the beautiful scenery around me, which had suddenly become vivid and alive. I was seeing it without a mental story or label attached to it, and everything made perfect sense, without the need for thoughts to reconcile it. It was a sense of knowing that settled over me that allowed me to see the beautiful necessity in everything that's happening in the world, including wars and suffering. As the full implications of this felt knowing flooded my body, I was on the verge of tears. Not tears of sorrow, but tears of joy. Before they started flowing, I found myself quietly laughing to myself. It all made perfect sense. I finally got the cosmic joke. You are what you seek. The truth of who you are is hidden right under your nose, where it's no wonder it gets overlooked. Though it was beyond what words could describe, it was like seeing how we're all perfectly connected in a way that makes us creators and products all at the same time. I had this sense that we're all pawns in a cosmic conspiracy to bring about this moment, to see and fully experience it fully. It occurred to me that everyone with whom we ever come in contact, even those we don't, regardless of how seemingly insignificant the encounter, are part of this conspiracy, whether they know it or not. The end goal of conspiracy is to get us to awaken. I also realize that everyone I see is actually a reflection of myself. They, too, are the same thing I am. The only difference is a perceived difference. None of these realizations were in the form of thoughts, as thoughts seemed to be relatively absent. Instead, they were just known or felt. If ever a thought began to form, it was instantly met with a sort of reassurance. For example, I started to wonder if this experience would end a and if I would be able to Dearborn, get back Michigan to this point if it did. Over but I was instantly reassured that I did not need to be concerned before the thought had actually formed. It felt as if, as if I was assured that... Um, excuse me. Excuse me. <clears throat> this allowed me to remain present without worrying about an unknowable future. Interestingly enough, when my wife asked a question or if I was in some other way called to do something, I seemed to be able to just snap out of it without losing my connection. 
My actions also seem to be much clearer and decisive without any tension. A sense of joy and wonder remains in the background and available for me to step back into at will. And I felt like I was learning to negotiate a switch, so to speak. Hmm. On the drive home, I smelled a very potent dead skunk smell. However, before the mind could step in and label it as a bad smell, I realized that the only thing that made it a bad smell was past experience. Instead, it took on somewhat of a sweet smell all its own. It was actually rather pleasant, which is kind of crazy. Uh, throughout the rest of the day, I took great joy in whatever I did, whether it was doing laundry, feeding the dogs, just watching in wonderment as everything happened of its own accord. I was doing it all for the first time without any stories from days gone by. That night, the dinner we ate was among the best I'd ever tasted, and I was just savoring every bite. I had to stop myself from groaning with pleasures. That was a bit much for my fellow diners to take. <laughs> in, in short, it was a great experience that I savored until I went to bed that night. The next day, I woke up to my normal mental activity, but with a residue of pleasure that I encountered the day before. It faded over the course of the next few days as I had to work to do in preparation for a business trip and though I've tried on a number of occasions since to reconnect I've not had much luck I've also spent a fair amount of time mentally analyzing the experience knowing that it wouldn't get me back to that point I'm very fortunate to have experienced that which I've been reading about for the last couple of years and I realize that I'm apparently not quite ready to live it quote unquote on a full time basis I recognize now that it is always here and can be experienced by anyone, anytime, if they're interested. And I highly recommend it and look forward to being there again in the future. Mm -hmm. And do you go on to say how, how one might get there, back there? Yeah, there's quite a few tips, techniques. Um, I don't know if everybody out there is familiar with Eckhart Tolle's teachings or not, but the power of now goes into a fair amount of detail on how you become fully present. The present moment is, a, in effect, the key. Mm -hmm. What I learned from that experience is um, exactly how deep the present moment is, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, present moment, when you become fully present, and drop all your stories, all your labels, all, all the things that have ever happened to you in the past, and you become fully present, then you get the opportunity to see everything for the first time. Mm -hmm. And when you get to see everything for the first time, this amazing thing happens, and the smallest thing brings about just the sense of joy and everything becomes alive again, whereas typically we're looking around at different things and instead of seeing them, we're seeing labels. Um, so if I look out my window and I see a bunch of trees, I'm seeing the word trees and the past story that goes along with trees. And if I drop those stories, become fully present so that I no, no longer know the word tree, and I just look in wonderment, as if I'm seeing it for the first time again. Now I'm seeing it for what it really is. I'm mm -hmm. seeing its essence, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so becoming fully present, I think, is one of the recurring themes. And in the book, there's several, I guess you'd call them meditation techniques. I, I'm not a formal meditator, but um, there's enough tricks and techniques, we'll call them, for lack of a better word to becoming fully present that um, I think that the average person can just easily pick up on and just stop, mm -hmm. pause, look at things for the first time. Um, and there's a couple other ways that I've, I've sort of come about presence. Um, the one that comes to mind is um, it's a memory technique where you look back at a past memory, which seems counterintuitive when you're trying to become present. But if you look at something that's happened in your past 
and you sort of relive that mentally. You go back, pick a pick an event that happened, an insignificant event, nothing traumatic, and just sort of relive that. Look at what yeah. it was like being there. And then look at what was there, observing it. Yeah. And see if that same thing is here observing this. And this sounds like a fascinating book. <laughs> it really does. Well, I've been <laughs> <laughs> well, Trey, we are out of time. We kind of had to t use up some of our time getting set up, but uh, I really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, thank you. And I will look forward to your uh, guest blog, and anyone who's watching this can read Trey's blog post at tvbackstory.com. Thanks so much. Thank you.